away from you. You know... What? I wonder why I'm like that. Like what? I'm never thinking about anybody, except myself. Well, you don't think I'd go without you. You mean that, Stan? Absolutely. You satisfied? Oh, Stan, I don't care for nothing now. Nothing in the world. You're not a regular MD, are you? Of course not. But anything my patients reveal to me is as sacred as though it were given under the seal of the confessional. Is that clear? All right, all right. You don't have to get on a soapbox. I'm going to be strictly on the level about this whole thing myself. Will you get out of here? I should have known you were that kind uh -oh. of a... It takes one to catch one. Listen to me. I'm no good. I never pretended to be. But I love you. I'm a hustler. I've always been one. But I love you. I may be the thief of the world, but with you I've always been on the level. Hello, welcome to Movie Umpers. My name is Bob Sham. Hello, I am Angela the Great. The Great, Angeline. Ooh, Angeline. The Mystic. I like that. Uh, welcome to Movie Umpers. My name is, <laughs> well, we already did that. <laughs> the sounds you hear may be dogs. And all month long, we're talking about classic film noir. Mm -hmm. We're calling it the left-hand endeavor. The seedier side of uh, movies. In mm -hmm. the classic Hayes Code era, film noir variety. We love film noir. Come across some interesting settings, and this one no less interesting. Because <laughs> we're talking about um, a Tyrone Power movie. We originally talked about Tyrone Power in 1940s, The Mark of Zorro. Tyrone, more known as the matinee idol type, swashbuckler type, adventure type. He oozes charisma in those movies. I, I actually recommend Mark of Zorro. Absolutely. It's a good, good-ass movie with a great sword fight in it. Yes. And But in this movie, um, Tyrone Power went to the studios and he was like, there's this book called Nightmare Alley written by Lindsay, William Lindsay Gresham. I want to be in the lead in this movie. Oh, so like he, he kind of got made the this ball. Happen. He got the ball rolling. I love it. Because and he got himself into the lead. Of the, uh, after, you know, some time he got himself into the lead. Of the I story. love that so much because he he is able to use that charisma, mm -hmm. that the magneticism that he has. Yeah. But. I mean, I mean this character is a con and you think Tyrone mm -hmm. can uh, nail it. And I think he does a fine enough job. Mm -hmm. But as far as like who steals their scenes, I would say... Uh, Joan Blondell, who plays Xena, oh god, actually I love her. is kind I of mean, the standout. Now, uh, this I love her. We're talking about Nightmare Alley from 1947, directed by Edmund Goulding. Edmund Goulding, probably our most prolific director in this era. This dude was directing silent movies from the 1910s mm. all the way up to here. I think he only maybe had four other movies wow. in him after this movie came out. But this is a guy that he put out a lot in the time. Even more so than Billy Wilder, who made a lot of movies. This guy yeah. just churned them out in his day. Interesting. And the uh the and it takes place in a carnival as as Tyrone P Powers playing Stan Carlisle, who kind of recently finds himself in this carnival where he uh is helping out Joan Blondell's character named Xena. There's like a a young girl who does like 
her little gimmick tricks or it's played by she's like the electricity girl molly carlisle um who's well she becomes a carlisle when she marries the lead but she's played by colleen gray and then we get a psychiatrist who's kind of really our femme fatale oh yes uh lilith ritter is played by helen walker and edmund goulding he got a whole broad acreage of sets for this carnival thing. Okay. And there are some pulled back shots establishing at the beginning, and it looks really cool. You see all the carnival stuff. Mm-hmm. And I did like the carnival stuff, and I like the crowds and the way he shot the rooms, especially when he's doing the readings in the cold rooms. Mentalism. But I will say that when it got away from the carnival life, mm-hmm. I felt like I, w- I was – was not feeling as strongly about it because it also got away from the Xena character, Joan Blondell, who's yeah. who is a very layered character who's trying to take care of her worthless, uh, uh, drunk ass uh, husband Pete, who she che- cheated on multiple times. No, Pete was all right till, till they picked me up. Well, what happened? Exactly what's happening now. I'm about as reliable as a two dollar cornet. Well, you're crazy. You've got a heart as big... Sure, as big as an artichoke. A leaf for everyone. That's what Pete said when he began hitting the bottle. One one time she cheated on him with was with Stan, when he's trying to muscle in on the gimmick that they're mm-hmm. doing. And he's trying to take over the operation that Pete was once very good at. And now he's just a fucking half-ass drunk who can't do anything right. Yeah, so Xena's whole thing is that she reads your mind or can tell the future or all of the above can answer questions and identify things when she's blindfolded and she and pete used to have this code and the code is a big deal and very valuable people who do like mentalism kind of stuff want this code it's actually really cool to listen to and i would i'm very i was very curious if they actually worked any of it out because the way they say things is very specific but it's like the words you say and also the inflections you're making yeah, on yeah. your words the inflections, is, is the giving syllables clues you're to using. the person. So you have to have two people. Yeah. So if Bobby was trying to guess things, I might say like, I'm holding something in my hand. What is it? It's a nude photo of your mother. It is, isn't it? And how is it signed? Pussy so good. You got a nerve, young fella. I hate you. <laughs> Come and get it, it says. I hate it when you bring my mom why, into the jokes. Why would your mother give you that? That's so weird. <laughs> We're just having fun over here. Uh-huh. Xena. Xena. Xena's amazing. And you think, that there's a couple things in this movie that that you think are going to happen in one way and they don't. And that's what I think is brilliant about this movie is that you think Xena actually is setting up to be the femme fatale because she's kind of the one who has the secret. She's got this drunk guy. She's like flirting with this young man. She's like plotting with him to la- to run off and leave and start a career over. This is what's great about her character because she's not the femme fatale. She's just no. a flawed woman. Yeah. But she has layers about her and, you know, she has guilt, and, but she also has bad habits at the mm-hmm. same time. Really, honestly, the best character in this movie. Absolutely. I love down. her. But she- we also have the return of Mike Mazurki. Mike Mazurki was in Murder My Sweet, the wrestler goon that hired Philip Marlowe. Well, he plays a strongman named Bruno. Bruno. Who I think is the dad of the no, Molly character. He's just very protective of Molly. Okay. He's not her father. Look, a, a family is what you make. Well, and 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 in this carnival family, Zena and Bruno are her parents. Mm-hmm. That is essentially yes, what is happening. Colleen Gray's performance as Molly, she does pine for the Stan character, and he kind of after he hooks up with Zena, he does hook up with her. So he is like a playboy when she decides to run off with him, and then they do their act together after. He acquires the code. Mm -hmm. Then she kind of becomes a little more basic, right? Wait a minute, mister. You're not talking to one of your chumps. She she seems unique, but then she just kind of becomes... I mean, she does have... She's the most morally centered, Yeah, I would say, by the end of it. But, but, you know, she doesn't really step up into that role 
after Joan Blondell is not seen very much in the movie. I would argue that she's basic from the beginning. Wait a minute, mister. I mean, she's a wide-eyed young girl who has a crush on this guy who is kind of older, seems unattainable because he seems to be with Xena. One of the weird things is that he always has her around when he's with Xena. She's also learning the code. Because Pete dies. So there's this there's this thing that we need to talk about where Pete is a drunk and Xena's tipped everybody off on the fact that Don't give him Don't booze. give him alcohol. Do not do it. And she's basically letting him she's giving him enough money to get one shot a day. Mm-hmm. And he wants to go buy some alcohol. In this moment, Stan has just found out that Xena doesn't want to run away with him. She's changed her mind. She read some tarot cards. She thinks something terrible is going to happen. She's right. worried about Pete. Hangman death or something the hangman, fell face down. Yeah, the hangman card is Pete's card. And then death was on the floor face down, which means Pete is going to die. And very soon. She gets Worried and she tells Stan, get away from me. I, I'm not doing this with you. I'm going to help Stan. And she decides she's going to send him to what they call the cure, which is rehab. But well, that same night. Stan buys a bottle of moonshine. Because he's now lost his big scheme to get out of this carnival. And he sees Pete drinking and he knows that he well, can't. Pete wants drink. Pete wants drink. No one will give it to him. So he puts, he, he stashes the booze at first in their little prop trunk. And then... As he talks to Pete, he decides, okay, I'm going to give Pete the bottle. How is it? Awful. But I wish I had a barrel of it. So he hands Pete the bottle and he leaves it with him. And Pete goes under the stage and he's just going to drink and fall asleep. Well, Pete fucking dies. They get up the next day. Pete will not wake up. And they look at the empty bottle and then they realize, and Stan did not know this didn't realize what exactly had happened. But when Stan put the moonshine in the prop trunk, what he pulled out was straight pure alcohol that they used to burn like note gimmicks when they're doing their mind reading. Yep. So Pete, when he sips it, he's like, oh, it tastes terrible, but, I, but I would, I'd love to have a barrel of it. Because he's a drunk. He's straight up. And he. Stan uh, didn't mean to, but he poisoned him. And Pete chugged the whole bottle it was an accident and killed him but it was essentially stan's fault talking about stan here he's a narcissist he's mm -hmm. greedy he's he's one of those guys that's rise to the top no matter what mm -hmm. when he feels like he's got everything he wants from you he doesn't really want you to be around that much once he gets what he wants that's true he's always looking for like the next thing and, but he and does have little bits of guilt here and there is a moment where he also questions like why am I such a greedy narcissist? I think that's when he's faced with our psychiatrist woman. Like he realizes he's kind of, they, they kind of reflect each other. But the thing I was going to add about his little wife is that he does hook up with her. Bruno and Zena decide in that moment that they have to get married now. You fucked her. You got to marry her. Yeah. They force them to get married. And then this was weird to me. He... And I don't think this was a put on. Maybe it was. But he seemed to just in that exact moment realize that he and his new little wife could go away from the carnival and do this because she'd learned enough as well that they could go and do. I thought that was his plan the whole time. Well, I think with these old movies, it I they got to lead us there. It's about the exposition, right? Yeah. They have to like say their thoughts out loud a lot of the time. Yeah, but yeah, that was the whole point of her bringing in and learning the code. Absolutely, with her. but he acted as though he was just thinking of it, and and now I'm realizing as I say it that this was all a show for her. Yeah. So he was never straightforward with her, even though he always said he was. The reason I know that she was the reason I'm saying she was plain from that moment is that she's just a good-hearted, naive young girl. There is a scene where he's staring off going, and we can go and do the show, and we can, you know, you know the code, and it's going to be amazing. And she is down lower than him, looking up at him in profile, only looking at him and saying, I'm going to be the best wife to you. You swear you don't, you don't regret it? And he's like, no, because this is going to be great. But he's, the, he's seeing dollar signs, mm. and she's seeing love and a family. Yeah. She does what she does because she thinks he's brilliant. And they do. They fast forward to like he's got this residency and he's in like a suit and she's in a ball yeah, gown. And they're well. like, 
doing the same act, essentially. The, all the scenes in which there's groups and rooms full of people, so crowds, good. those are the best shots. Mm-hmm. So one of the things, too, about, like, Xena goes away, but then she is sort of replaced with your psychiatrist woman. It feels like an entirely different movie. It does. Each act feels completely different. You've got the carnival setup part, which is so much fun, and I really wanted to stay there. I did. I'm When we left the carnival and we left Xena yeah. as a consistent character, I, I, I felt like it was like a void a little the bit. The best part of the mentalist second act when he's you know doing this and making all this money and and he tries to like he has this plan that he's gonna go to the next level and basically they call it he's turning from like a mentalism to doing like spook work pretending he's talking to to the dead so they're they're saying like ghost work so his wife doesn't want him to do it and then we see xena and bruno actually show up yeah. And he's pissed that they even showed up, but she misses them. She loves them. They're essentially her parents. He doesn't need them anymore, so he doesn't care so if they're So he doesn't care. Around. Get out. I know what I'm doing. I don't need any help from a couple of cheap carnival freaks. Go peddle your stuff where it belongs. Get out! Stan! Who are you calling a freak? Bruno. We've got to get that 130 bus. Come on. Zena, I'm sorry. Forget it. We meet the psychiatrist because he does a performance where the psychiatrist knows that he's cold reading. She knows the tech. Oh, yeah. She, she figures so it she out. She tries to bait him by asking a, a, a card question regarding her sick mother. But he's clever enough to know that he's being baited. I'm afraid a truthful reply to that question will appear rather strange. I, I don't know whether I should answer it or not. Why? I get the impression that the lady's mother has been dead for some time. So he makes the lucky guess in front of the crowd that her mother is dead. And he's right. So then that's when they have kind of a friendship. I think they did fuck. But it's like, you know, all the fucking's always off camera. We know he and Xena fuck because they're like lounging around in their bathrobes. He yeah. married uh, Molly, so we know they hooked up. I think he did bone the psychiatrist. I think he did, too. I mean, he goes, when he's distraught one night, he goes to see her, and she's psychoanalyzing him, but she's in her robe, and he went to her in the middle of the night. Well, he discovers that she records all of her sessions, and, of course, a lot of her clients are big deal people in town who tell a lot of dark secrets for a guy that's pretending to to read minds and speak to the dead oh this is too good to be true yeah so and he kind of tricks her into having that explained to her at least that's the way it seems because they kind of acknowledge early on that they're kind of not that different from each other yeah they essentially go into business with each other and there are a lot of off camera scenes where things happen that then we just find out in the exposition. like Very she, common for movies of this time. Yeah. So, so you know, there's this woman who we meet her earlier on that's one of her clients that has this daughter who's dead and she wants to see again. So he uses her to kind of start it. And then she wants to give him all this money. But, but the psychiatrist hooks him up with this super wealthy man that she knows that's like crazy wealthy. Um, but has had a really sordid past. And he's in love with this woman who's been dead for 30 years. That's his daughter. No, it's a woman he's in love with. So he sets up a thing, but Molly doesn't like it. Well, you're going against God. How do you figure that? Do you think I'd be getting all those letters? That's what makes it so terrible. Everything you say and do is so true and wonderful. And you make it sound so sacred and holy. When all the time it's just a gag with you. You're just laughing your head off at those chumps. You think God's going to stand for that? Do you want him to strike you dead? Because he talks like a preacher. He's a con man. He talks like a preacher. This is like a chick tract. Uh, exp- like you could narrow this down into a chick tract. Chick tracts. Let me explain for people who don't know. <laughs> They're little evangelical little we might comic. Have one around here. Little comic books uh, that were originally started by this guy named Jack T. Chick. They are were very like very Protestant, very anti-Catholic little booklets that. Um, 
where it'll have like this little moral story where a character does something, whether it play, he plays Dungeons and Dragons and which gets him wrapped up in the devil. So you could narrow down this chick track to where, or uh, drinks alcohol. Stan's real greedy and he wants to be a mentalist. And then, uh, he wants to talk to the dead and then he's got this little girl that's like, you don't want to turn away from God. You don't want to play God. You're dealing with Satan. Mm-hmm. It'd be a lot more pushing the Satan angle in the, oh, in the yeah. book. There'd be a lot more Satan talk. And so you get the scene of them faking the guy's old lover and then it becoming exposed. And then at the end, this guy goes to hell because he played God or that's whatever. Kind of, yeah, that's kind of exactly the plot of this movie. The, I think also Scientologists uh, would like this movie because it makes uh, psychiatry seem dangerous oh they're yeah totally evil yeah she's a to- she is the she, i wouldn't she, say totally evil, no but where we don't feel, i'm thinking of how a psychologist might describe her behavior he has the psychologist hold the money that this guy fronts yes and he's supposed to get more when he's faking the re- i would have just told this guy like look i can do a lot of things i can't bring back the dead. well that's what he said he said i cannot make you and the guy said i will only believe you if i can literally see dory who is the woman i am in love i with. would have settled for the one hundred and fifty thousand that he initially gave totally same but they don't and they he talks molly into pretending to be his long lost love but as molly is seeing the guy drop to his knees and pray please please I know what What right have I to ask for mercy when I have never shown mercy to anyone? No! No! no I can't stand! I can't! What happened? Not even for you! Oh, what? Who, who are you? I'm Sam Get out of here! Get out of here! This, this isn't, isn't real. Right. I'm his wife. You can't. I'm you're so playing sorry. God. And it was kind of interesting because he's trying to gaslight her a little bit in the conversations. Like, where did I mention God? Where did I mention this? Mm -hmm. Like, he's talking about the technicalities as though you had, as though not referencing it directly doesn't mean you're not trying to be that. But we all know that's like a bullshit argument anyway. This is also the point where I do feel like she went from being like a little more spunky to taking on that sort of like Judy Garland, like. But why would you do it like that? Yeah, she had a little... Why would you do it? She kind of did have a Judy Garland thing yeah. going on. Well, the the gig is busted, but they've got that $150,000 they can take it and leave town. When he goes to pick it up from the psychiatrist, who he's been in cahoots with to learn more about people, she hands him the envelope and he runs off and he's counting it in the car. The It's not $150,000. Re- she replaced it with $150. Yeah. So he goes back and fucking climbs in her bedroom window. Yeah. And this woman who either is her maid or lives there, or it's a part building, I don't know, comes in with a gun. And she basically is like, this is one of my patients. It's okay. And she fucking gaslights the shit out of him. She is the femme fatale. She... She's also like low-key way hotter than Molly. Oh, yeah. oh, she's, but you don't feel bad for this guy, it right? Goes, for me, it's like Xena, psychiatrist, Molly. Yeah, it's like I think Zena's the hottest one, honestly. She's a little older, but I do not I, care. I agree, but I did like the psychiatrist lady. Yeah. And the fact that she's so crafty kind of mm-hmm. lent it to the hotness. Sure. But yeah, she fucking grips the fuck out of him. Please, Mr. Carlyle, try to understand that these delusions of yours in regard to me are a part of your mental condition. When I first examined you, you were being tortured by guilt reactions connected with the death of that drunken mentalist during your carnival days. What are you trying to pull? You can't prove anything. Besides, it was an accident. I told you that. I'm a psychologist, not a judge. But he's a sociopathic grifter himself, so who cares? But she is smart enough and crafty enough in her field to make him vulnerable enough. She's fucking with him to the point of, he's like, you called the cops because there's a siren? Yeah. And she says, why should I call the police? Don't you think I got ears? What about that? What about what? That police siren. I don't hear anything. This is Truly reverse making gaslight. making him think that he's crazy. Also, one thing we did, we failed to mention that I think is important because it starts coming up at this point is at the beginning in the carnival, one of the very first, the very first moment we see is there's a geek. Yeah show at the carnival and the geek is 
basically the way they describe it in this and I've never I've known I've always seen like the the pictures of it being like a guy eating like the head off of a chicken right uh, yeah I think, but I've never really understood kind of the thing I think the definition here has also seems real it seems like it's your most fucked up guy that exactly the, the way they describe as it opposed is, to just a man doing a bit yeah they describe it as someone who is basically so down on his luck that he's willing to do anything for alcohol. Like they, they give him a bottle a day and they feed him and he he eats live chickens in their show. And the only and, reason Pete isn't the geek is because of uh Xena. Yes, because Xena's taking care of him and and he did not end up that way. But he uh Stan is fascinated by the geek. He actually says to a couple people, like, how does someone get to that point? And he's told multiple times, you'd be surprised how easy it is to get to that point. In certain moments throughout this movie, when Stan is having a crisis or feels as though he is losing his own grip, he hears the geek screaming. Yeah, which I love. And this is a moment where he hears the geek screaming. Mm. And you just know that he's... He his mind at this point has broken in a way that's not going to be fixable. Mm. And he goes to the train station to meet Molly. And he tells her cuz even though she fucked him over, he was going to go he was going to take her with him. Like yeah. they were going to go together. He told her if you can get there in time, I'm going to leave you if you're not there, but if you're there I'll take you cuz you know I'll love you whatever. He kisses her goodbye, puts her on a train, he tells her just get to the carnival. He gives her the only money that he has and he says just go to the bucks. carnival. Yeah, it's 150 bucks. And he says, I'll make it. It's fine. This is where he spirals. And we get the scene you were talking about. As he spirals, the movie gets even darker. Yeah, he becomes like a hobo guy. He, I love the, the, the sad man makeup that gave Tyrone power. The movie also seems to a little bit overstay its welcome going into yes. the end here. I kept thinking it was over. It and should, it kept doing one more. It should honestly. Now in the book, apparently it is more simple. He does become the geek, as you expect. He becomes the worthless drunk. I think in the book he drinks himself to death. But the Hollywood, the producers, the production, the studio, they want to flash it up a little bit. And that actually led it to being overstaying its welcome a little more than it needed to. Yeah. Because he does become that drunk. He does become that geek. He goes to the same carnival. But they don't recognize him because he's such a fucking mess. And they hire him and they make him the geek. And he lashes out one night running around. And then Molly sees him, realizes the geek is Stan. And then it ends on them like, oh, Stan, Stan. He comes, he recognizes her. Yeah. And now she is Xena and he is Pete. Yeah. That is where you end up. It's full fucking circle. We still get a full circle. It, It would have been great, honestly, to... He he sends her off, mm-hmm. but maybe, I guess it makes sense that he's got to be the geek, right? That's definitely where it's going. Yeah, but, but it he could have like been it, the geek in any carnival. It, it could have wrapped itself up 10 minutes prior before absolutely. it did. And the, the little punchy, upbeat ending, I mean, somewhat upbeat. He's still the Pete, right? I thought he was carrying a pipe around. I thought he was going to kill her. Yeah. That would have been... The ending super at dark. that moment, it would have been super dark. <laughs> but honestly, at that moment, if he'd been so out of his mind gone that he hit her in the head, now she is burdened with this man yeah. who only took advantage of her for the rest of her life. The other thing that feels heavy handed in the full circledness of this is, you know, he's the bum, whatever. And then when you realize we're going back to the carnival, we get that big swooping from the back image of the carnival that's just like at the beginning all bright and nice and it feels wrong in that moment Mm -hmm. yeah like it feels out of place it's attempting a bit of an upbeat finish and it doesn't not it doesn't land that great but there but the setting is very unique for what we're talking about this month and there are some good characters here Yeah, totally it's a it's a far from perfect movie but it's kind of memorable and apparently uh guillermo del toro remade this movie in like 2020, 2021, but it got got lost, lost in the pandemic shuffle. Oh it gosh. did release, but it's got Bradley Cooper in the stand role and Kate Blanchett, who I maybe plays Xena. I don't know. Apparently, there's or a or the psychiatrist. There's a lot of stars in this movie, and I could imagine Del Toro did a good job with all the. I want to see this. Yeah, I'm I'm curious too. Del Toro doing a carnival 
freak show? Are you mm. kidding? Yeah, playing up this like this mentalist con character. Guillermo, I, you had me from minute one in this film. I was completely gripped. But Shape of Water, I stopped eating fish, and now I'm not going to eat chicken anymore. So I don't know what you've done to me. <laughs> <laughs> Dietary restrictions. Yeah, I, I haven't heard. I would check it out. You know, for a Guillermo del Toro movie, for a guy who, whose movies get a lot of word of mouth, I I only fairly recently heard about this. I, I think it got hit by the Streaming, pandemic. Yeah. So. But that is the 1947 movie Nightmare Alley by Edmund Goulding. There's uh, no alley. Yeah. This movie's got everything but alleyways. But the movie is a nightmare. Where? Yeah, there's some nightmares. There's even a dialogue about nightmares. But where's the alley? Did I miss an alleyway in here? There's no alleyways. There's the back-ass side of a circus carnival tent. I didn't yeah. see one goddamn alleyway here. We didn't even look at the alleyways in the building by the psychiatrist. Nope. We didn't even go to the alleyways by the hotels they were staying at. He should have put her on that train, drank a fuck ton of alcohol, and died and in walked an alley. down an alley and, and died. died. Died down Followed in an alley. Followed over in an alley. Oh, that wouldn't see. Good night. Good night. Not Good nightmare, alley. Maybe Del Toro <laughs> uh, th- ha- actually has alleys in his. Maybe. Maybe. If I sit through that... Guillermo del Toro, Nightmare Alley, and there's not an alley in that. I'm burning Hollywood to the ground. <laughs> Joke is over, smell the smoke from all around. <laughs> so you're gonna give this one through five. I'm gonna give this one through five. Yeah. Combined for best out of ten, we hit up some the seediest, most film noir sport boxing, and now it's like carnival shit. Yeah, that could get seedy. But realistically, I'm going to give it a respectable 3.5. That's exactly what I was going to say. Solid 7 yeah, movie. Solid 7. It's sharing the rankings with other movies such as Love, actually. <laughs> Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Ooh, Dracula has okay. Risen from the Grave. Captain Blood. Black Christmas. Barbie. And A Fistful of Dollars. It's at least as good as those movies. Hell yeah. If not better. Nightmare Alley. Check the show notes for links and other places to find us. This is our second week of uh, the Left Hand Endeavor in the can. Next Monday, we'll be talking about another Philip Marlowe movie, The Brasher Doubloon. I think it's a little bit more low budget than the other ones <laughs> we've talked about, but we're going to see how that pans, and we will see you next week with plenty more film noir haze era bangers. All right? So subscribe. We appreciate it when you do that. Thank you for the corrections. Apparently, Rita Hayworth was not singing in Gilda. Someone let us know of that. A very common thing for the time. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, but I love those corrections because Absolutely. it means they listen to the show or watch the video. And, that's the and best part. And I think part. that's fascinating because I never for one second thought it wasn't her. That always fascinates me when they're able to pull it off so seamlessly. But thank you for spending the time. And, Definitely. Uh, supposing we get out of here. Supposing we do. Dietary restrictions.